Well, hello, music fans. This is Peter Scove for Music is a Journey, episode 51. And today, we're going to do a band profile of a band, one of my favorites. Now, this kind of came about because last month, on February 11th, the band, Voivod, released their 15th studio album, Synchro Anarchy. I wasn't able to get a hold of my copy until around February 23rd, but I did pre-order. And uh, it is getting a lot of great reviews. People on the internet are saying about how this band, after just about 40 years, are still able to put out really good, interesting, and fresh albums. So I had the idea that I wanted to talk about Voivod's discography, talk a little bit about each of the albums. And then I started checking videos on YouTube and I saw a lot of people doing similar kinds of videos or ranking the albums of Voivod, the studio albums, and talking about them or talking about the discography. So as I watched, I noticed sometimes people had some of the information about the band and sometimes they weren't quite sure or weren't quite sure about the pronunciation of things. And I thought, well, okay, let me research that. And as I started reading up more about the band, of course, I realized there was a whole lot about Voivod that I did not know. Um, a lot of things I just understood happened, but I didn't know the reasons for why they happened, what was going on behind the scenes and that sort of thing. So I have been checking out lots of articles and interviews on the net, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 15, 16 different ones. I've also watched a lot of interviews, including a few in French, which quite honestly, I really don't understand very much of French when I listen to it. If I don't read it, I'm probably going to understand almost nothing. <laughs> but anyway, I did check out lots and lots of interviews, pieced together a lot of information. There was one site, um, it's Agoraphob Agoraphobic News. They had a very long, detailed article called The Seven Chapters of Voivod, uh, the Voivod Saga. Um, it details all the information about the creation of the character, the Voivod character, and the seven albums, yes, seven, that tell his story. Um, it is really long, but packed full of information. And just at the end, when I had finished, more or less putting all my notes together, I found on the Voivod website there was something written back in 2009 a timeline of the band going pretty much covering everything that i was planning to cover plus some details that uh kind of um added to what i already had going on so what i'm going to do is talk about the history of the band voivod and talk a little bit about the albums in their discography so this video promises to be a really long one since I just love going into detail. So what I'm going to do is break it down into three parts. We are first going to take a look at the beginnings of the band and their kind of rise to success in the 1980s. In the second part, we're going to take a look at what the band did in the 90s and basically the decline of their success and leading to, of course, the kind of temporary breakup of the band. And then in part three, we're going to take a look at what happened once the band got going again and take it up to the present day. So I hope you will stick around for all three parts. For now, let's get on with part one. Here we go. So you've probably heard that Voivod are from the city of Jonquière, or at least it was the city of Jonquière. It is now a uh, district of Saguenay. In the, at the time when the guys were all young lads, Jonquière was one of the cities together along with Arvida, which had the Alcan aluminum plant, and Kenogami, which had the pulp and paper mill. And in 1975, those three cities were all amalgamated to become just a larger Jonquière. Now the pulp and paper mill and the aluminum plant are important in the history of Voivod because they have a lot of influence on um, Away's drawings as well as the lyrics of many of the songs. So let's take a look, uh, starting from when uh, Michel Langevin was a young boy. When he was five years old, he was struck by a car and that left him with a fear of mechanical things and he always tried to keep some kind of distance. He didn't like to be around mechanical things or machines, but it did inspire his drawings. 
And another thing was that at night when he went to go to bed, he could hear the sounds from the aluminium plant and he often wondered what kinds of creatures or monsters lurked in there at night. And sometimes it gave him nightmares. And in the morning when he awoke, he would draw the types of things that had haunted his dreams at night. So at a very young age, drawing became a very important thing for Michel. By the mid-1970s, Michel had discovered a French magazine called Metal Hurlant, which is the magazine that inspired the American magazine Heavy Metal. These magazines, of course, were famous for their science fiction stories, and Michel was very much inspired by some of the artists there. And in fact, there was one particular drawing of some soldiers coming out of the ground in one of the stories, which was an inspiration for the image of the Voivod character that he would go on to create. When he was 12, he happened to find a book called Les Talismans des Voivodes, and he thought the name Voivod was, was very interesting and it kind of stuck in his mind. And a couple of years later, he read the French edition of Bram Stoker's Dracula. And again, he came across that word, Voivod. Now, a Voivod in that story was the title of a, basically a kind of prince, which Dracula uh, had assigned to himself, that he was a prince, uh, a Voivod. However, that title also shows up in a lot of Eastern European languages, meaning usually someone of very high nobility or high rank in the military. So that's uh, where that idea came about. And so uh, Michel thought that he would create a character called a Voivod, which was um, the Voivod, which was also a Dracula, I mean, a, um, a vampire type character. Now, originally he says that his drawings were um, they were science fiction fantasy, but a little bit more in the sword and sorcery fantasy style of drawing. However, uh, by the late 1970s, he heard music by Crass and um, Conflict, <laughs> me checking my notes, as well he saw some movies, a National Film Board movie called If You Love This Planet, and there was movies like uh, The Day After and Threads, all of these things dealing about the stockpile of nuclear weapons in the world and the possible threat of a nuclear disaster, what would happen, uh, what the world would be like afterwards. And so that really strongly influenced um, the Voivod character and what type of world he lived in. At the same time, he also was inspired by Lord of the Rings and uh, the land of Mordor, which uh, Mordor, <laughs> He borrowed the name and changed the Voivod's land to Morgoth. So Voivod lives on a planet or a, a place called Morgoth, which has uh, repeated nuclear wars. It is probably a really terrible place to be. So it was Michel's dream to have his drawings one day published in Metal Hurlant. Um, however, uh, that actually never came about. In the meantime, he started taking up the drums. He became interested in the Beatles when he was around 9, 10 years old, and he was impressed by Ringo Starr in the Hard Day's Night movie, so he took up playing the drums. He was, of course, into the 70s progressive rock scene because in Quebec, that is the place in North America where progressive rock first really took hold. And there was a very big progressive rock scene in Quebec during the mid-1970s. Then, by the late 1970s, this whole hardcore punk movement began, and then, of course, the new wave of British heavy metal. And in one interview, Michel said that it was the new wave of British heavy metal that he felt was really music for his generation. And he was particularly impressed with the debut album of Iron Maiden. First of all, because the music, it was heavy metal, but it also carried some aspects of punk and progressive rock, which were, of course, the three styles of music he loved. And as well, the cover featured the Iron Maiden character, Eddie. And he realized at that time how important it was to have that kind of character or mascot, what kind of impact it would have and how it would become associated with the band by the fans. Around 1979-1980, Michel and his friend Denis de Moore started jamming together. Denis played guitar and played bass, uh, but they needed somebody to play bass for them, of course, so they got in a friend, uh, Jean-Pierre Fontine, to come in and play bass. When Jean-Pierre first met them, he was very impressed with Denis' guitar playing. He said that he played 
guitar phenomenally well for his age and as well he could also play bass like a pro. So Jean-Pierre joined the band for a little while and they were jamming together but uh, he felt that their musical taste was getting more for the faster aggressive side of heavy metal which is not where his interest lay so he left them and Michel and Denis they found a guy named uh, Jean-Yves Thériault who was one night he was a, a DJ playing heavy metal records at some club and so they said hey you sound like you like the kind of music that we want to play why don't you join us but at the time Jean-Yves didn't play any instruments so Denis had to teach him how to play the bass now this was around 1981 so we've got the very beginnings of the band in place three of the four founding members but still things are very loose uh, Jean-Pierre came in one time to see how they were doing and thought yeah um, Denis is still teaching Jean-Yves how to play the bass and it's a little bit uh, not so tight Around this time, Michel thought, well, it would be a good idea for him to take some time away from the band. He was also starting college around this time as well. So he focused on his college studies and as well, he practiced his drumming for about a year. By the time he joined up with Denis and uh, Jean-Yves one more time, um, those two had become really tight playing together guitar and bass. And so he rejoined them. This was probably around the fall of 1982. Uh, Jean-Yves left temporarily, Jean-Pierre stepped in and then once more Jean-Pierre stepped out and Jean-Yves came back in again and basically here in the fall, late 19, uh, 1982, the band Voivod was formed. Now, Michel showed the others his drawings and explained the story concept behind the Voivod and Morgoth and they thought that was really cool and they all thought it would be a great idea to incorporate that character the drawings and the story into the band's image. They needed a singer, however, and so it was late in 1982, they went to an improv theater where uh, a fellow by the name of Denis Bélanger was in the theater and he was given the role to um, improvise a worm on the stage. And so he got down and was wriggling around on the stage and afterwards, they decided to ask him if he would join the band because they wanted a singer who could be very theatrical. So why not choose somebody from the improv theater? <laughs> so they asked him to join and he accepted. And there at the beginning, uh, January 1983, the four founding members were finally all together. In the beginning, they wrote, I mean, they, they covered material by Venom and by Tank and uh, Motorhead and so on. But then they finally started writing their own original stuff. They also decided to take on nicknames, just as Venom had done. And so Jean-Yves Thériault took on the name Blackie, which was the name of a dog of his that he loved very much. However, the dog had been poisoned. So he took the dog's name and as well, he said that it suits his personality because he is the darkest one in the band. Denis de Moor, he was always a little bit of a round kid, as it was said, so he took on the nickname Piggy. Uh, Denis Bélanger, he was a snake, a worm on stage, so he took on the nickname Snake very naturally. And uh, finally, Michel Langevin took on the name Away which was partly due to his drawings being really far out, but also because he was still attending college and doing homework assignments, and so he was often away from band rehearsals. That is how the four members took on their names. <laughs> so they started writing their own material, they started recording some demos, and they played their first show in June of 1983, and then by the end of 1983, they recorded a full album's worth of demo material, which included songs that were going to be on their first and second albums, a couple of cover songs, and a song or two that ended up never appearing on either of the first two albums. And that release came out in early 1984, and it is this one here, To the Death, which was finally re-released around 2011. This shows Voivod in the very beginning and they are really loud and aggressive. Snake's vocals are quite different from what we got to hear by the time the first album came out. 
Um, it is a very interesting album to hear what the band sounded like at the cusp of their career blossoming into a full-time professional recording artist band. Very interesting stuff here. So that was released and a friend of theirs, who was very impressed with them, sent a copy of one of their demos off to Metal Blade Records to the home of Brian Slegel, who really liked what he heard and asked the band if he could use the song Condemned to the Gallows to appear on his Metal Massacre Volume 5. Metal Massacre, of course, was the collection where uh, Metal Blade featured its artists, which had included bands such as Metallica, Slayer, and Exodus, as well as Flotsam and Jetsam. So, there we go. The beginning of Voivod appearing on that label with Metal Blade, and then Brian offered them a record deal. To record their debut album, they each borrowed $500 from Snake's mom for a total of $2,000, and they did eventually pay her back. And the band went into the studio to record War and Pain. At the time, or somewhere shortly after, I've heard it said that at least Snake thought it must be the worst record in the world because there they were a bunch of inexperienced kids in a recording studio laying down their tracks and it just sounded terrible. This opinion was actually reciprocated by Kerrang! magazine where a reviewer totally hammered the album and even called the band a void vod because he said the album was so terrible that was the worst band on the planet. However, the review actually tickled the band members a bit because they thought, hey, if we're going to be the best at something, we might as well be the best at being the worst. It's better than being middle of the road. And it also means we're worse than Venom. <laughs> so the band went and released here, Voivod, War and Pain. Now this for me is kind of a special album because this was an album I picked up on cassette probably around 1985 at a record store where I often went to pick up new metal albums, new bands I'd never heard of. And they had a section of this more kind of obscure underground stuff. And this is where I first picked up Slayer, Exodus, Bathory, Celtic Frost, Possessed, Omen, I don't know, lots of other ones, Destruction, Creator, that kind of stuff. And I remember Voivod's War and Pain and thinking, well, that's a pretty cool album cover. Let's hear what they sound like. And I actually really liked the album. In fact, I probably like just about every song on the album with the songs Voivod, Warriors of Ice, um, Black City, Live for Violence, and Nuclear War being among my favorites. I know a lot of people have mixed opinions about this because the band got so much better later on, but I still always really loved this album, War and Pain. Now the band were pretty thrilled about having a debut album out, but how was a band from Jonquière, Quebec going to get anywhere in the international heavy metal world? Well, as it turned out, there was a guy who was managing a local band called Helter Skelter and their technician said, hey, you should check out this band, Voivod. They have uh, an album out with an American label. They have a contract with the label, check them out. So this fellow, Maurice Richard, yeah, there's a famous hockey player too, Maurice Rocket Richard. This fellow went by the name of Maurice the Rocker Richard. Anyway, he went to see Voivod play and he was totally floored. He had never heard a band playing so heavy before. Maurice then agreed to manage the band, and one of the first things he did was get them to relocate to Montreal, where they went into a brand new rehearsal space for the band, where their gear was promptly stolen, including Blackie's amp to give that bass sound that you hear on the War and Pain album. That was a bummer. Also, Maurice decided that they should let their option for a second album with Metal Blade Records pass. They were paid after two years and 40,000 album sales of War and Pain, they were paid only a thousand dollars. So that was a bad deal and apparently the song Off and Die on the second album was actually written as a response to Brian Slegel. Now what's interesting is that I saw on the Sea of Tranquility YouTube channel, the fellow there, Pete Pardo, he did a 
uh, four-way, like a three guests and himself talking about uh, their ranking the albums of Voivod, and one of his guests was Brian Slegel, who had only great things to say about the band's album. So I guess he didn't take it uh, too personally or didn't hold a grudge. Anyway, so they were now without an a label, they had their gear stolen, but Maurice was ready to help fund the band and push them ahead, and he decided to organize a concert to gain more exposure for the band. In the summer of 1985, the label Banzai Records in Canada, a um, subsidiary of Polydor Records, had held such a heavy metal concert featuring bands such as Exodus, Metal Church, Slayer, Hallow's Eve, and Agent Steel. So Maurice wanted to organize the same type of event with Banzai and Polydor Records, and he called it World War III, where Voivod would be headlining. Now, the thrilling thing about this concert was it was the first appearance in North America for Celtic Frost from Switzerland and Destruction from Germany. As well, it was the first concert outside of California for Possessed. And also Nasty Savage from Florida came up. So you had these five bands playing. Um, what a bloody awesome show that must have been. But yeah, it was a great concert and it certainly did gain exposure for Voivod, especially since Martin Ain of Celtic Frost took some of their demos with him back to Switzerland. And he showed the demos or let them... Um, their their guy at Noise Records, the label they were signed to, he introduced the Voivod demos and told them about the band. And so within a short time, Voivod had a recording contract with Noise Records and they released their second album, Roar, which I think is pretty much how you'd want to say it. Their second album, Roar was released on March 14th, 1986 on Noise Records. The cover features the Voivod, who was a soldier on the previous cover. He is now, I don't know, part of this kind of mechanical killing machine type thing. The album continues with the story of the Voivod. I think he has now taken on the name of Korgal the Exterminator. Um, of course, the Off and a Die song is on here, Build Your Weapons. Thrash, thrashing rage, and so on. This album, to me, always felt a little bit more intense, more chaotic, and more thrashy than War and Pain, which had songs similar to the ones on here, but also had songs that seemed to move into different parts and change the tempo and so on. So a little bit more of a progressive edge on the first album. This one here is more of a straight-up, in-your-face, heavy thrash speed metal type album. On April 4th, 1986, Voivod played their first show stateside, opening for Cro-Mags and Venom at the Ritz in New York. And a young man who went to see that concert brought the album back to introduce to his good friend, Dave Gruel. Dave says that he Never heard such a loud and fucking chaotic band in his life. And Voivod left such a lasting impression on him that even in an interview in 2008-2009, he still went on for nearly 20 minutes raving about Voivod, which is pretty darn cool. After this, Voivod toured the US with Celtic Frost, and as well, because they were now with Noise Records in Europe, they could also tour Europe, which they did with Possessed. They then had to record their third album after their tour was done in Europe, so they had to prepare all the material for the third album while they were still touring in North America, so that at the conclusion of the European tour, they could head straight into the studio. During their tour of the U.S., by the way, at one of their shows, probably in San Francisco or anyway, somewhere in California, um, one of the band members of Flotsam and Jetsam, the bass player, Jason Newstead, showed up. He already had an interest in the band because he was really impressed with the music uh, while they were still together on the Metal Blade Records label. And Jason became a longtime fan of the band from that show. 
Voivod also headlined another uh, basically heavy metal festival in Montreal this day, this time a two-day festival event called No Speed Limit. From 1987 and over the next three years, Voivod released what is sometimes called the Holy Trinity of Voivod albums, and it started in 1987 with Killing Technology. The band had added to their sound. Instead of just going for straight up thrashing heavy metal or putting in these kind of slower heavy parts, they actually started to incorporate more progressive rock influences in their music and that transformation was pretty darn sharp. Remember that Roar featured material that was mostly written as far back as 1983. But by 1987, the band already had new ideas coming together and the Killing Technology album showed this new side of the band. They still had their kind of punk edge, especially in Snake's vocals. They still, of course, were a thrash band going for speed and heavy riffs. But as well, there were all these strange transitions in the songs and time signature changes really a strong influence from the progressive rock scene and of course one of the things that Away points out is that he is a big fan of Van der Graaff Generator which is one of those more uh, on the left side of things in the progressive rock scene I mean not so straightforward like Genesis and yes a little bit more of the kind of more difficult to get into kind of thing there so that was also an influence coming into the band's music and what's very interesting was Killing Technology, which is my favorite Voivod album. Uh, I remember getting that in 1987, so I would have been 16 at the time. But there was a young fella out in uh, Quebec who was 11 years old, and he recounted going off to the store on his bicycle, and that was the first cassette he ever bought. And the fella in question goes by the name of Daniel Mongrain. And also the very first concert Daniel went to was the Voivod Nothing Face concert uh, a couple of years later with, I think he went along with his friend Dominique Laroche. So these two young guys became big fans of Voivod very early on in their days. And we're going to hear more about them a little bit later on in part two. Remember those names. While checking out some of these Voivod albums ranked videos, I've heard a lot of people really heaping praise on this album. Sometimes it is people's favorite choice, sometimes it is their second or third choice, usually changing places with Dimension Hatros, the album after this, or uh, sometimes with Nothing Face or a different one. There was one fella who said that not only is the whole album absolutely brilliant, but side two on this album is probably a perfect side for a metal album. And uh, it starts off with Forgotten in Space, and then after that you have Ravenous Vent Medicine, which of course they made a video for. You have Order of the Blackguards, which I just love. And then you have this, uh, this is not an exercise, which is also one of my favorites. I have to agree, side two on this album is just one of those perfect album sides and I really love Killing Technology, Overreaction and What the Heck Tornado 2. The CD release also features Too Scared to Scream and Cockroaches, which uh, Cockroaches was inspired when the band lived in a small uh, apartment together in Montreal that they all shared, which was totally infested with cockroaches. And they said they used to come back and roll up newspaper and so on and open the door before entering the apartment and uh, start whacking away at the cockroaches. So uh, that experience influenced, uh, inspired the song on the album here. During the tour for Killing Technology, Maurice Richard began having anxiety attacks. And so for his health, he decided he should step away from Voivod and step out of the music scene a little bit. The band continued touring in North America with Violence from California and then in Europe with Creator. The fourth album, Dimension Hatros, uh, was recorded in West Berlin, right near Checkpoint Charlie. And the band recalls that there was a very strange atmosphere about the place because you had these surveillance helicopters. And they actually did go to the border and request permission to enter East Germany. However, they were denied on the account of that they looked a little bit too weird. 
The new album was released on June 29th, 1988. Dimension Hatros continues the story of the Voivod character. This time here, he goes into some kind of um, experiment which sends him into an alternate miniature universe. And basically, each of the tracks on here is one of the worlds that he explores. One of the big songs coming off here is Tribal Convictions as well. Some of the other ones like uh, Macro Solutions to Mega Problems, Chaos Mongers, and Brain Scan. This also features a very short track at the end of the band covering the Batman theme. Curious that. <laughs> but anyway, um, one interesting thing here. This is, of course, by some people, this is considered the best Voivod album, even Snake himself. Uh, for Louder Sound, when he ranked uh, his top 10 favorite Voivod albums, this was his choice for number one. Sarah Kitteringham, who is a music journalist, music photographer, gives commentary for the Banger TV channel, as well as uh, album reviews. And she is also the lead vocalist for the epic doom metal band Smolder. She said when she was going to college in Calgary, she got a hold of this album and she played it nonstop for something like two months straight every day commuting to and from school. So this album was really an album that makes a huge impression on people. For some strange reason, I never got it at the time. I also missed Roar when it came out. As much as I loved War and Pain and Killing Technology, I missed those two albums, this one and the other one here. And so I haven't developed the same love for this album as I have for War and Pain, Killing Technology, and Nothing Face, which I also got at the time it came out. I only picked this up back in 2011 when I suddenly was re-interested in Voivod and thought I would check out all the albums that I missed. Tribal Convictions, though, is one of my favorites, and Brain Scan is also brilliant. Um, overall, I do agree. This is an excellent album. Still, though, my heart goes with Killing Technology. The band toured the album, but they had to cancel the tour in Europe because Piggy developed a tumor on his um, hypophysis gland uh, on behind the optic nerve. And he was going to either have to have an operation, which could have left him blind, or he could try some new experimental drugs which would dissolve the tumor, which he did and the tumor was dissolved. So thankfully, Piggy was able to keep his vision, but it did unfortunately cost them the European tour. Around this time, the band started to uh, negotiate with Mechanic Records, a division of MCA. And so for the next album, it was actually released on a major label, MCA, Mechanic Records. That was the fifth album, Nothing Face. Nothing Face was released on October 13th, 1989. It continues the band exploring their progressive, their own version of progressive metal. This time here, taking it perhaps less aggressive, less thrashy, uh, less metallic, uh, heavy as the previous two albums, but um, less than the previous two and going a little bit more into the kind of borderline, I'd say, between progressive rock and progressive metal, but still keeping the signature Voivod sound. The story was actually about a character called the Nothing Face, which was based on um, the idea that uh, of someone with no arms, no legs, no eyes, and basically no connection to the outside world and they basically search for what their character is and explore different personalities. And in this story here, the Voivod is going through that experience. He is becoming the nothing face. He is exploring different characters. And by the time he tries to get back to his original persona, he finds that he has been locked away inside some kind of machine. And so all these chapters, the songs are all chapters in this kind of story. As well, um, they focus a bit on schizophrenia and Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's particularly being of interest because a lot of the people working in the aluminum plant industry were um, allegedly, a lot of them came down with Alzheimer's. And so um, an interesting point to mention about the lyrics and themes, the concepts of Voivod songs is that even though they are science fiction, they are based on real life fears about the harms of technology 
and industry and so on. And so that is reflected in the lyrics. Because the theme of schizophrenia was part of it, they thought about Sid Barrett, the, one of the, the, the founder of Pink Floyd, and they decided they wanted to cover a Pink Floyd song, Astronomy Domine, from their debut album. However, uh, they had to contact David Gilmour about getting permission to use the song, and David Gilmour was not a member of Pink Floyd at the time that song was recorded. However, he was a member when they recorded the song live for the Amagama album. So they contacted David Gilmour, asked permission, and said, we want to do Astronomy Domine, but we want to do the Amagama version. And David very soon gave them his reply and gave them uh, his blessing to record the song. So, Astronomy Domine by Voivod appears on the Nothing Face album. There was a video made for it, and this actually was a kind of minor hit for the band. As well, the album sold somewhere in the neighborhood of 300,000 copies and got them spot number 114 on the Billboard charts. Probably the most successful album of the band to date at this point, and also one of their most famous albums. The Nothing Face character story was actually planned for a comic, and once again, Away thought he would love to see it published in Heavy Metal magazine. Um, however, the story uh, never did appear in the magazine. It does um, appear, like in pieces here, there's all sorts of artwork within the album, which shows uh, a bit of artwork for each of the songs. So I guess in that respect, uh, Away's artwork was getting out there. Certainly, his style is as unique as Voivod's music, and he was building up a reputation for his drawings. Because Voivod had now switched to MCA Records in North America, um, Noise Records did not support a European tour for them, and in fact their next album would also be released in Europe under the MCA label. So once again they missed out on an opportunity for touring in Europe. Um, Voivod toured in Canada with this album opening for Rush, which was a dream for them, especially Away spent uh, most of the concerts uh, watching Rush from backstage, watching Neil Peart's drumming and trying to learn how he did his drum rolls and so on. They had known of Rush, of course, in the 1970s and uh, had been fans of the music, so this was a special dream for them. As well, uh, touring the United States, they had Faith No More and Soundgarden opening for them. However, during the course of the, I think it was two months or so, they found an interesting change was happening in the popularity of heavy music in North America. By the end of the tour, Faith No More and Soundgarden were more popular than Voivod. And Away points out that he could really feel there was a change happening in the music atmosphere. And we're talking now around like 1990 or so. Yes, the grunge scene was coming up and the extreme or at least uh, thrash metal scene and hair metal scene for that matter were on the way out. So, with an album on a major label that sold quite well, a minor hit single, Voivod were finishing off the 80s on a high note. However, after the Nothing Face tour, there was a change happening in the music scene overall. How were Voivod going to approach this change in the scene? What were they going to do next? Let's find out about that in part two, where we take a look at what happened with Voivod in the 1990s. I hope you'll stick around for it. Thanks for watching part one so far. Catch you in the next one. Bye, folks.